Welcome, everybody. We're really pleased to have Mark Fraunfelder with us today, who's going to talk about making makers. And Mark is the founding editor-in-chief of Make Magazine, the founder of Boing Boing, and the editor-in-chief of CoolTools.org. He was an editor at Wired from 93 to 1998, and the founding editor of Wired.com, and is the author of seven books. His latest book is Maker Dad, Lunchbox Guitars, Anti-Gravity Jars, and 22 Other Incredibly Cool Father-Daughter DIY Projects. As a maker of things, Mark has built cigar box guitars, skateboards, electronic musical instruments, chicken coops, kinetic sculptures, and robotic monkeys that keep cats from jumping on furniture. Linda, you may appreciate that. <laughs> he has conducted workshops that teach people how to make sauerkraut, program Arduino microcontrollers, solder circuit boards, build vibrating toothbrush cars, and construct mandolins from tuna cans. Mark lives in LA with his wife Carla Sinclair and his two DIY daughters aged 10 and 16. A couple of things you might not know about Mark, he, he knows he's learned how to play the ukulele, so we have a number of ukulele players at um, Milner, so maybe there's some discussion that could happen about that afterwards. Um, and he, uh, with, along with his wife and two daughters, decided to move in 2003 to, from Los Angeles to Rarotonga, an island in the South Pacific, where they lived for five months and experienced all kinds of adventures and other things that was a real learning experience. So everyone, please join me in welcoming Mark Fraunfelder. So I want to start with an interesting fact about, uh, about farmers. Here's some farmers with uh, a bunch of equipment. In 1900, 80% of Americans worked on farms. They either lived on farms and were farmers, or they lived in the rural areas and worked on the farms. By 2012, only 2% 2 of Americans worked on farms. So th that's a really interesting statistic. And farmers were makers by necessity. They, they weren't doing it for fun. They did it because they had to. They were away from cities where they could have things repaired or made for them. So most farms, or all farms actually, had some kind of workshop there with lathes and milling machines and other kinds of equipment where they could make, modify, and repair the equipment that they needed to do their jobs. So they became very handy, they became very innovative, they became very resourceful at using their hands and things to, to accomplish what they needed to get done. I was interested in like checking out farmers as, as makers, so one of the things that I came across was this old farming implement catalog from around the turn of the, the previous century, or, or the previous before century. Um, and it was incredible. I mean, this is a, a multi-hundred page catalog of everything you could imagine. I mean, you could actually rebuild civilization after the zombie apocalypse with one of these catalogs. Really cool stuff. And so, farmers were, were busy making all of this stuff. Um, along comes this guy. His name's Hugo Gernsbeck. He was, uh, I, I believe, from Lithuania, immigrated to the United States. Um, and he's known uh, mainly today as the father of science fiction. He came up with the very first science fiction magazine called Amazing Stories in the, in the 20s. But he, before that, he started publishing magazines that kind of catered to these, uh, these uh, rural uh, uh, farmers, people who were good at using their hands. He thought, you know, in their, in their copious free time, uh, uh, why not give them something that they can do that takes advantage of the skills that they have? So he came up with a bunch of different magazines. Um, uh, the Electrical Experimenter from 1913, The Experimenter, Science and Invention, Radiocraft, Everyday Mechanics. That's a picture of Hugo Gernsbeck right there, looking at the equivalent of a widescreen television set of the day, and, and it's remote control too. Um, Hugo continue to be innovative and invent things into his old age. Here he is with his TV glasses, 1963. Take that, Google Glass. 
So I was interested in checking out Hugo's uh, uh, work, some of the magazines, and so the, the one that I was interested in checking out was the Electrical Experimenter, because that sounded some, pretty close to something that Make Magazine would, would uh, be, be doing. And it was amazing because the, the, the projects that are in the Electrical Experimenter are exactly the kinds of things you would see today in Make Magazine or on Instructables or on YouTube. Check out these articles from 1917 to 1918. This is like 100 years ago. Wireless transmission of power, free electricity from the wind, a radio-controlled model boat, electricity to prevent future fuel crisis, utilizing burnt-out lamp bulbs. It's like I started thinking, you know, making in some ways has not changed one iota since its infancy, since, since the early days of hobby making. Things have not changed at all. And so I, I started looking at some of these magazines that, that were published by Gernsbeck, Radiocraft magazine. This is an interesting project. You can make a, uh, a parabolic microphone to record bird sounds at a distance. And so you see this guy's got this set up. It's pretty hardcore. It's, there's some kind of power system in the van. He's got an assistant there and everything and some kind of a sighting scope and everything. But uh, regardless, as soon as I saw that, I thought, you know, we have done something very similar in Make Magazine. This is a project from Make Magazine. It's a parabolic microphone and it's uh, made from parts from a dollar store. So it's got like a, a small umbrella, a paint roller, you can see the paint roller handle, and then um, a microphone uh, headset from a cell phone. So it's a $3 parabolic microphone. And uh, the van and the assistant cost extra, but... <laughs> and then this was uh, uh, back when everybody was wearing these radio helmets. They showed you how to make one yourself with, with tubes sticking out of them. The new radio hat. Well, in Make Magazine, we had something very similar. Look at that. It's a hard hat, and it's got like buttons and knobs and switches on it. People like those kinds of things, then and now. So moving forward a little bit to a different magazine in the 60s. In the 60s, people were moving into the suburbs. They had more room to do their projects so that they could have larger scale stuff. They had bigger workshops. They could r roam around the neighborhood. And what better way to roam around suburbia than in a go-kart? This one was especially interesting to me because it is a battery-powered go-kart. And it's an electric go-kart. Really cool. And so, again, when I saw it, I'm like, they beat us to it. <laughs> Even down to the red wheels. And I like the way that this guy is, is being safer and less safe at the same time. <laughs> Here is a suitcase-sized power cycle. And I guess to, to uh, keep that claim accurate, they had to make a suitcase that was as big as you see over there. <laughs> but... Uh, once again, like, check out the size of that suit, uh, of, of that cycle, and then look at the one we did for Make Magazine. It's like exactly the same. Um, and the, the motor, you can see in the back, is a 36-volt battery-powered drill. And believe me, it's got tons of low-end torque. When I was driving around the Make offices, it scooted right out from under me, and I landed on my butt. <laughs> Teaching her wireless. You can tell he's like really interested in teaching her Morse code. <laughs> but there's some truth in it. When I go to maker fairs today or hacker spaces, I see couples working together. It's like a fun geek couple activity. And, and it's not only uh, couples, but it's, it's also uh, kids and families doing stuff together. So, so there's this big connection. There's this link between uh, old school making and modern making. But I want to uh, focus just for a minute on something that uh, I call the dark ages of making. It was between around 1970 to 2000 when, when making things for, for fun and, and fulfillment really like plummeted. It took a nosedive. And so uh, here's a good example to, to, to show you what happened. Take a look at this 1973 issue of Popular Mechanics and all the all the stuff you see, the cover lines, is like a complete car care guide, how, to, how, how you need to put your car in top shape, keep it running smooth, looking new, uh, plans for vacation homes, how to wire a yard light, how to silence squeaky floors, how to hang sh shelves, how to repair a damaged roof. It's all about how to do things. 
And then we fast forward to the year 2000, same magazine, Popular Mechanics, and we are looking now at something that's like stuff you can't make. You're not going to make the world's tallest building in your backyard, and it's like the fastest PC you can buy, not make, in brain implants. Nobody's going to be doing brain implants at home. <laughs> So, I'm, so it's like, why is this happening? Why, why did we have this dark ages? Why didn't making just continue from 1970 to today uninterrupted? And I think that this might be one of the main reasons. Um, take a look at this 1954 television set. It was a color TV, which was pretty rare in, in 1954 and you would pay 1,175 US dollars for it. Adjusted for inflation, in today's money, that's paying $9,700 for a TV set. So if you put that much of an investment into a TV set, you really wanted to be careful with it. And, and if it broke, what you could do is you would remove the panel on the back of the TV. You were meant to do it. It was like a, a user serviceable item, and you would pull the tubes out of the back of the TV, you would take the tubes down to a local uh, drugstore, and you would plug it into this tube testing station. I remember my dad doing this when I was a kid. You plug the tubes in, you see the upper right-hand corner there. Um, you plug the tube in, and, and a little uh, uh, needle on a meter would tell you whether or not the tubes needed to be replaced. So you were like, you were a, a caretaker of the stuff that you owned and you, uh, you kind of knew a little bit about it. And so you, you had an investment, and when you fixed it and repaired it, um, that made you feel like you're more of a participant in the design world around you. This is something I found that was interesting from a 1962 issue of Popular Science. This guy sent in a, a photo of how he would transport a picture tube by using a seat belt in the front of the car. And so now you know why cars in the 1960s had seat belts. <laughs> So let's move to uh, 2014, and here is a 19-inch color television set, and you can get one for $140. So you adjust backwards in inflation, that's $17 in 1954 dollars. So another way to look at that is that a 1954 customer paid 70 times as much for a smaller TV. So what happens when one of these TVs breaks? Uh, it's like, what else, what other choice do you have? Um, first of all, it's like hard to open the thing because it's probably like glued, lots of, lots of the enclosures are glued together rather than screwed together, so you can't even get to them if you want. The components won't pop out. They're all just little surface mount components. And if you tried to take it to a repair place, they would say, it's going to cost me more to fix this for you than it would be to just go back and buy another one. So they end up being discarded. So people started to like lose the idea that they could maintain the, their things, and so they started to like lose the, their maker skills. And the magazines kind of followed suit. They they said, okay, we're going to go where where people are going, and instead of like showing them how to make this really cool looking yellow car on the left, we're going to show them a, you know a revolution under the hood this kind of car that, um, as, as Matthew Crawford wrote in his book, Shop Class of Soulcraft, when you open the hood on a modern car, the only thing you find under it is another hood. So we, we've been seeing this decline in, in DIY in mainstream culture, but fortunately, there was a, a rise in, in DIY in, in different subcultures. And so uh, uh, the, the whole earth catalog was kind of like a, a manual for uh, hippies to reboot civilization, uh, moving to the communes and showing them how to build geodesic homes and how to make their own uh, uh, sewage systems or raise goats. It even had stuff about early computers in there. It was a fantastic magazine in it. And it was there to show people the tools that they could use to empower themselves to take control over their lives and, and the communities that they had developed. And then, uh, the, uh, the punk rock culture was like a huge influence in DIY because it, uh, it led to um, 
uh, people uh, booking their own tours, pressing their own records, basically short-circuiting the music industry so that they could get their music out there. And, and one of the outgrowths of, of punk uh, was the zine revolution, which is where I really started becoming involved in, in DIY in the 80s. These are some zines from my, um, my collection of zines that I still have. They're, uh, you can see they're like inexpensive. Some are rougher around the edges than others. They were often focused on narrow topics. But uh, it really was like the, the early days of desktop publishing made it possible for people to create their own media. And so many makers today tell me that they had zines in the early 80s and 90s, and that the zine revolution was a big part of that. And I feel that that was the way it was for me, too. Um, Boing Boing, the website I do, started out as a zine that my wife and I started in 1987. It's, it's since moved on to the web, but um, it is very much still has that DIY spirit. So, so fortunately, I think that uh, this, this uh, DIY subculture movement has expanded back into the mainstream. And starting around 2000, it really started picking up, in many ways thanks to the internet, allowing people to share their plans and projects and tips with other people online. And I can divide the, the modern maker movement into two different phases. There is uh, phase one, I'd say that was from 2000 to about 2008, and it was about uh, making cool things and then showing those things that you've made to other people, either online or at maker fairs, and giving plans how to do it, uh, sharing those things. And then somewhere around 2008, we saw another really cool development. And what it was was that these makers, these DIYers, were taking the same do-it-yourself mindset and applying it to tools and systems and techniques not just things, but uh, tools, systems, and techniques for other people to become makers and make stuff that is like an order of magnitude more sophisticated and complex than the, than the earlier things and uh, make it accessible to people who weren't necessarily uh, 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 adept at technology. I'll just take a, a little side jaunt here to, to show you some examples of, of Make Magazine. It was a magazine that started in 2005, and um, we have about 100,000 readers. And our audience, our readership is what we call broad spectrum enthusiasts, as opposed to like a, hobby, a hobbyist who has a, a very focused uh, interest, like uh, you know, model trains or, or bonsai trees or something like that. A maker is someone who's interested in everything around them and wants to like, participate in the, the creation and maintenance of all those different things. They don't necessarily want to master them, but they want to just have a say in it. So that it might be you know, customizing a piece of equipment that they have, um, learning to sew so that they can, can uh, modify their clothing or something like that. So the kinds of things in Make Magazine reflect that. We had, uh, this is a fun article about uh, doing car hacks. We had one about making musical instruments, one about uh, do-it-yourself botany. Uh, one of the fun articles in that, that one was how to make a fruit tree that had different kinds of fruit growing from it. So you could have li limes, lemons, grapefruits, oranges, tangerines, all on the same tree. Uh, one about restoring old pinball machines. Uh, fringe technology one was was one of my favorites because I was always interested in curly and photography, which was this uh, thing that was kind of popular in the 70s, and they said that everything emitted an aura. And uh, look how cool that that quarter looks. It's it's really it's just you're just applying a, a high voltage to it, and uh, it will emit that kind of uh, corona. And then simple robotics projects. Some of the stuff in the magazine, I'll, I'll just show you a, a couple of my favorite projects. This one was made by uh, a fellow who contributes to the magazine frequently. His name's Larry Cotton. He actually um, wrote a lot of stuff for Popular Science in the 70s, and he was so glad when Make Magazine started up again. He's like, finally, you know, I feel like I found a home again for my, my projects. One of the things that Larry likes to do is take photos of the songbirds that come and visit uh, his bird feeder. But as Murphy's Law would have it, when the bird lands on the bird feeder and he's in his uh, kitchen shooting out the window, the bird is always like hiding behind the bird feeder. He's like, you know, what can I do about that? So he, he 
there, there wasn't a market solution for his project, so he decided to do it himself. He put a small motor on top of the bird feeder, and then a remote control, like a, a, an airplane, model airplane thing, and he can just like rotate the bird feeder until the bird is in a good, good angle. And the birds don't mind. It's rotating slowly enough. They're, like, they're too into the food to, to worry about something like being spun around. And so... Uh, the, the, his next idea was, well, you know, most remote controls for airplanes, they have two channels, one to control the elevator and, you know, one to steer it left and right. Um, so with the second channel, he added another servo motor and put it on his camera to press the shutter button. And then that way, now he has the camera just sitting on a tripod right next to the bird feeder so he can be really close to it. And he's just like sitting in his, his window there. You see him with his remote control. <laughs> And uh, he's taking care of it. And look at those cool bird photos there. They look really good. He's got some great shots. Another one, uh, I have a, a friend who goes by the moniker Mr. Jalopy. He lives in Los Angeles. And uh, his favorite thing to, to do is what he calls deep sea suburbia. And that's going into the uh, uh, San Fernando Valley part of Los Angeles and going to garage sales and estate sales. And, and buying old tools and uh, old furniture and uh, LP records, old records and stuff. So he, uh, he bought this old stereo hi-fi cabinet, and then he would play the LPs that he bought every Saturday morning. He, he would get a stack of like, you know, a dozen LPs and play them. And he thought, you know, it would be great to have some way to kind of archive all these songs so that I don't have to like pull out an album and you know which song was where and everything. So he came up with what he calls the world's largest iPod. And you can see it's got a, a computer monitor. There's a Mac mini inside there. There's an iPod and the buttons, all the buttons on the cabinet he rewired so it operates the iPod and the, and the Mac mini. And so now what happens is he comes home from a garage sales, puts the records on, and as he plays them, the songs are all digitized and converted into MP3. Um, the, uh, he uses some kind of internet service that finds what the songs are and then uh, uh, assigns all the metadata to it. So he's got the album name and the artist and the song and everything. Now he, and then he can just uh, store the LPs and he's got all the songs stored on the hard drive on his world's largest iPod. This is something that was not available as a commercial product, like Larry's uh, bird spinner. So they're things that, you know, these makers wanted to have in their lives. So they're like, you know what, I'm, I'm just going to make it and see how it turns out. And, uh, and I think they're very cool solutions, and they're unique and show a lot about the personality of the person who makes them. And it makes their houses and where they live much more interesting places when they're filled with their own creations like that. So most people are familiar with potato launchers, these PVC pipes that shoot potatoes. And so this one, we, we did our own spin on it, and we used clear PVC so that you can see the explosion as the potato flies out of the, out of the cannon. And in the magazine, we like to have our opening shot, kind of like a, a shot looking down at your workbench with all the components that you need to make it. And you can see it's pretty simple. There's the clear PVC. You've got your potato. Um, there's a, uh, a stun gun that uh, is used to create the spark that ignites the propellant, which is a can of right guard. And so uh, the next time you use antiperspirant, remember that it also makes a really great explosive gas. <laughs> this is a, a really popular project in Make Magazine. It's a, it's a giant size water rocket. You probably remember those small water rockets that are like red and white, and uh, you pump them with a little hand pump, and they shoot up 30 feet or so. This one goes 300 feet in the air, and it's made from two large soft drink uh, containers. And um, this is a little picture of, of how it works. And I have a, a short video to show you of the creator with his kids doing a launch. Okay, guys, that looks good. That's a little. <laughs> His name's Steve Lodefink, by the way. We want 100 pounds, none of that wimpy little 60 stuff. How much do you think this thing will hold? Is it strictly more propels? More what? More. Uh... Uh, I mean, it's a. The, the bottle is rated at 100, I think. 
insert the retaining pin. Get the clip on. So we're gonna go for 70 pounds. Uh, zooming in. So you can see the, it's a great project, um, and uh, the cool thing about this is that unlike the kind of solid propellant rockets that sometimes require you to have a permit or you're prohibited from using them at the beach or in certain parks, this one really you can launch anywhere because there's nothing flammable about it. It's very safe as long as the parachute deploys. <laughs> this is one of my favorites. It's probably the best, best invention ever made. This guy doesn't uh, like to be woken up by a loud buzzing alarm, so he made an olfactory alarm. It's a bacon, a bacon alarm. <laughs> and so at the appointed time, it starts cooking bacon. And he wakes up to that great smell, and his breakfast is half, half made for him. I, I don't know why this hasn't become a product yet. This is a cool one too. This guy just wanted to challenge himself to see um, how much of a piece of, of plywood, a, a two foot by three foot uh, piece of plywood could be used without, without wasting anything to make, make these chairs. So he used up, up almost every single bit of the plywood. You can see everything fits like a jigsaw puzzle. There's just a couple of little tiny wedgy pieces there that, that aren't part of it. But, uh, they look like great, they're, they're great looking chairs, they're uh, attractive, and it's kind of, it's, it's something that's uh, a good example of when a maker starts to develop skills in something. They want to like set new challenges for themselves, where they, they uh, get a little bit out of their comfort zone and try to do something that they haven't done before. And uh, that's, that's one of the great things about making, is you can start at any level, really, uh, you know, something that's simple to do, not much of a challenge. And once you do it, then you're like, okay, I, I can do this, you know, I, 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 what's next? Let, let's keep on going. It, it never gets boring. It's, it's a bottomless thing. It's, it's really great. So th this, this gets to be the, the really fascinating part of, of the maker movement, I think, is how these, these DIYers not only are like making cool things, but they are looking at DIY alternatives to all of these kinds of things that typically would require you belonging to a large organization to accomplish. Like these, you could think of these as being like divisions of Samsung or Sony, where they would have R&D and design and advertising, manufacturing, uh, securing funding and stuff. All of these things that you see here there are DIY versions that are either free or really expensive, but also very powerful and effective and don't require a lot of expertise. So um, as long as you're passionate about something and you have a lot of perseverance, you can, you can make things that look like they were developed by a consumer electronics company. And I'll show you some examples. And... Uh, uh, so, so I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you actually examples of all of these different uh, uh, DIY um, systems and, and why they're so effective. So when it comes to R&D, before, uh, you know, large corporations hire research and development teams, uh, engineers and scientists to uh, seek out opportunities, uh, uh, refine concepts to, to create products. And so... Uh, it's expensive to do. You have to hire a lot of people to do it. But really, the web itself has become a distributed R&D team for everybody, for individuals and for companies. So I, I typed in remote control lawnmower into Google Images, and this is what I got. These are people who are mowing their lawn, s sitting very comfortably in chairs in a couple of cases. <laughs> and imagine like 10 years ago or 15 years ago, if you wanted to build a remote control lawnmower, you would like 
you know, you really wouldn't go around your neighborhood knocking on doors and asking people if they had built remote control lawnmowers before because it would be a waste of time. You'd know they hadn't done it. But you go online and you can find the thousand people in the world who have done it. And not only that, chances are that they will respond to you and help you. The interesting thing about makers is they're a very open, friendly group of people. That's why I love meeting makers and going to maker fairs and stuff. It's just such a positive uh, group of folks. This is a really good example of, uh, of R&D um, moving from, from makers to the corporate world. Um, so see that red line there? That is a, uh, the temperature, of uh, uh, the water temperature in an espresso machine over time while the water is being heated up. And you can see that it varies from about 195 degrees Fahrenheit to 240 degrees Fahrenheit. There's like a, about a 45 or 50 degree Fahrenheit temperature swing when water's in the boiler. And if you're making espresso, that's like, that, that's a bad uh, variable to have. You, you really want to nail that down to like a couple of degrees because otherwise you get really inconsistent espresso. Um, depending on the temperature. That's just too much variation to handle. And so people who were into making espresso at home came up with all sorts of ways to, to get around that. Like one thing they call temperature surfing, where they, um, before they put the coffee in, they heat up the water, they turn on the, uh, the, uh, the, the uh, button to, to pour the water out, and they wait for it to stop hissing, and they count down, and they put the espresso in. It, it took, took a lot of time. So um, this, this guy, on uh, the alt.coffee Usenet group um, who worked for a, a, a US government uh, organization called the Department of Standards and Measures borrowed a uh, special temperature control system called a proportional integral derivative temperature control system and he attached it to his espresso machine. And he found that he could get the temperature so that it would vary just 0 0.1 degrees Fahrenheit. And that's the blue line you see there. The, the, uh, the sh sharp drop there is when you pull a shot of espresso. And th that's just a n normal, natural thing to happen. But you see it just quickly right goes back up to the baseline temperature. So the system just locks in the temperature. So you've nailed down that variable if you're an espresso maker, uh, home espresso maker, and it gets you that much closer to pulling what's called the God shot, which is like <laughs> the perfect espresso shot. So these people started like saying, this is cool, Can you? how did you do it? And so he gave complete plans and everything. And so more people started doing it. They started selling, people started selling kits and things. This is my espresso machine at home. And you can see the kit that I, I've attached on the left. And so I have uh, this temperature control thing. And the funny thing is that um, espresso machines have been being manufactured for uh, over 100 years. And none of the major espresso companies have ever thought of doing this before. It took this kind of distributed DIY maker culture to come up with this idea. And now they've introduced PID temperature control into their espresso machines. And so they're also using this distributed group of hackers as their, as their R&D teams too, which is a, a really cool thing, I think. Um, what happens when you get... Uh, this, this is like kind of what I'm showing with espresso machine development, but you could apply this to almost anything. Um, the innovation curve was, was very uh, flat until the advent of the internet and people being able to, to share things quickly. And then as soon as they started sharing things and people seeing what could be done, the innovation curve just shoots up. It's kind of like what uh, Eric Raymond said about open source software. Um, when, when there's enough eyeballs, all bugs are shallow. It's, it's really easy to find, locate problems when a lot of people are attacking it at the same time. Makerspaces are kind of like a local physical presence for that, that same phenomenon. Um, instead of being distributed, they're, they're concentrated. And that has advantages, too, because you can get a lot of uh, uh, serendipity uh, at work and, and cross-pollination of ideas and disciplines together. If you go to hackerspaces.org, you can see that there are hackerspaces all over the world. Design has, has really changed in a big way, too. Um, this is uh, uh, 
some stuff that's, that's created using really inexpensive 3D design software that, uh, that you can get versions that are $0 or $99. Google SketchUp is a really um, popular version of it. When I started working as a mechanical engineer in the mid-80s, the first year I was there, we, uh, we were all using drafting tables, pencil and paper, T-squares, all that kind of stuff. And then uh, the second year, we got some workstations with CAD software on it, and we were really excited about it. And they had it in a special room. There was like a mini mainframe computer attached to these workstations, and the software cost like $50,000. And then you got charged, the company got charged per hour for, for using it. Like once a month, one of the representatives from the software company would come with a, with a meter, and he would plug it into the workstation, and, and it would show how, much, how many hours the uh, software had been used, and the company would get a bill for it. So uh, SketchUp, which costs nothing, is literally 10,000 times more powerful than that software that, that uh, my company had paid $50,000 for. And so people are making all sorts of great stuff. And, and uh, you know, if they were just making it for themselves and stuff, that, that's, that's great. But they're sharing it online in digital model libraries where they can upload those plans and share them with other people. And other people can, can modify those designs, print them out on 3D printers or laser cutters, and do all sorts of really cool, cool stuff with them. So again, you're seeing the innovation curve just shoot up like crazy. Another thing that was uh, a challenge for me when I was an engineer was, was sourcing materials and components for things. That was harder than you would think. So I, I was doing a disk drive development, and so if we would want a certain coating or, kind, uh, or bearings for, uh, for the spindle motor, we would have to go to the, uh, to the library at the company that I worked at, Memorex. And a lot of times they were out of date. It was hard to find. It was never quite what you wanted. So you'd be making calls to vendors and doing all sorts of stuff. But now the, the internet itself has become like an indexed surplus store where you can find just what you need very quickly. So I, I needed some photo resistors. And I went on to eBay. And I found th these photo resistors. I bought the, the set at the bottom because it was uh, only $2 for 20 photo resistors, and they were shipped for free. There was no shipping, and they were shipped all the way from, from Hong Kong. I can't believe how they can make any money doing that. Can you? Like, it's crazy. It was all wrapped up nicely in hand stamp postage. Somehow, it, it's worth it for them to, to do that. But, uh, so it's really easy to get materials. And then there's a, a, a website called Alibaba that's for kind of larger scale things that can uh, uh, Get, get you uh, sophisticated components and work directly with vendors to get things custom made. So uh, uh, Chris Anderson, he's the former editor of Wired magazine. He started his own uh, autonomous drone company. He, he needed some motors. He was selling some kits, his first kit, and he needed motors for his, uh, for his kits. And so he, he found a, a vendor on Alibaba, and he said, I want 100 motors, because he was going to make 100 kits. And they're like, okay, that's fine. We can make those for you. It will be $1 a motor. He said, okay, great. And I said, but however, if you want 5,000, you can have them for 17 cents each. And so he said, okay, I'll take 5,000. <laughs> and he ended up actually uh, selling all of them. His, his, uh, he quit Wired and is working full time for his company, DIY Drones. And here's another great example of materials. If you're in the, if you're in the market for uranium ore, and you want low, medium, or high grade ore, it's in stock. But if you want super high or ultra high, it's sold out. <laughs> 3D printing, uh, it's great to see that the library here has a couple of 3D printers that are operating. Um, it's become something that uh, I don't even need to say what a 3D printer is anymore. It's really great. Um, everybody knows that these things are, are, uh, are uh, really part of the future now where 3D printers are, are here to stay in our lives. I just like this picture of someone who made a 3D printer out of another 3D printer, self-replicating. And then service bureaus. This is something that I think is pretty amazing also. When I started um, working as an engineer and I wanted to get a prototype made of something, 
I would design it on the CAD system, copy that file to a floppy disk, drive across town to a model shop where a guy would take the, the disk and upload it to his hard drive and convert it into tool paths and then have the thing um, machined out of some plastic or aluminum or something. This is if I wanted like a, a, a fit uh, prototype to just make sure things fit. And so sometimes he would call me and say, you know, the file's corrupt or something. Or So I'd, you know, come back, give him another disk. Uh, he would make it, it would take like two weeks basically to get something and there would be a problem with it. There would always, there's always, that, and that's why you make a prototype is to, to find out where the problems are. And so I, we would do it again. It, it could be a six week process before you, you got a, a prototype working well enough that you could say, tell the manufacturing division, okay, this one is, you know, ready to, to uh, be manufactured. Well, service bureaus today, it's like, completely different. You, you do your design at home and then you just upload the design to a place like Shapeways. This is a little character that uh, my, my friend who is a uh, designer at Disney uh, did in 3D. And so he uploaded it to Shapeways and Shapeways will show you, they, they create your own like a store for you and they show you what it will look like, um, give you the price. You can actually then share this this site with other people and they can buy it and you can charge more than, than Shapeways is charging you so you can, can make a profit if you want. So he ordered a couple and there they are. They look really cool and if you wanted to, um, if you were like a toy prototyper or, or a toy developer and you wanted to make prototypes, instead of hiring a model maker or something and waiting all that time, it's just so much cheaper and easier to do it this way. It's pretty incredible. Another great prototyping tool is Arduino. I think most, how, how many people have heard of Arduino? Oh, that's great, almost everyone. Um, just, I'll just be brief then. It is a, it's a printed circuit board about the size of a credit card that allows artists and designers to add interactivity to their projects without being an electrical engineer. And so this is an example, a guy named Michael Hart. He's not an engineer, but he came up with an idea <clears throat> he made this box and he gave this box to a friend of his, uh, a couple of friends who were getting married. He said, this is your engagement present. And so they tried to open it and it wouldn't open. And so they pressed the button thinking that that would make it open. But the only thing that happened when they pressed the button is that they saw like a number that said 393 space 1 slash 20. And they're like, what is this? And he said, well, get in your car and drive for a while and press the button again. So they got in the car and they drove for a while and they saw 397 space 2 slash 20. So it took them a while, it took them a little while, they thought about it and they're like, okay, that number, that first number, 397, is how many kilometers we are away from a certain spot. 2 dash 20 means we've used up two out of the 20 button presses. <laughs> so we have to figure this out. So they drove around and it took them a while, but they finally got to him. When they got to that spot, they pressed the button, click, they heard the sound and they opened it up and there was their little anniversary present inside. I think it was a couple of rings or something like that. So the, the, the great thing is that Michael made this on his own. He's not an engineer. He used an Arduino, very simple code, a GPS sensor, a, uh, a servo motor, the same kind of thing that goes in a model airplane, that, that opened and closed the latch. That's it. And it was under $100 for everything. And um, he was able to really kind of prototype the whole thing in a weekend or two. Imagine like making something like this 15 years ago before there was the internet or, or these cool prototyping tools that had been developed by DIYers. This is something that would have cost a ton of money to do. Um, and a lot of expertise. But this is now, it's just somebody who had a, a cool idea. They, they went online, did some research, and they came up with this. And now he's uh, licensing these so that if you want to make one of these for yourself or to give away to friends for free, you're perfectly welcome to do it. And Michael even has instructions on how to do it. If you want to make them and sell them, then talk to Michael and he'll uh, give you a license to do it. It's a really cool, uh, cool way to do it. So open source is really... Uh, change things. Um, this is an Arduino powered peanut butter stirrer that I came up with and uh, uh, what it does is every 24 hours it rotates 180 degrees so that that, that horrible natural peanut butter when you stir it and oil gets all over, 
when you flip it 180 degrees, it turns out that the oil will slowly work its way back up to the top, mixing with the solid material as it goes along. And uh, it actually works. Another cool uh, prototyping tool is called the Raspberry Pi. It's a, a Linux computer that's about the size of a credit card, again, like an Arduino. And like an Arduino, it's under $40. And um, you can use it to make all sorts of cool things. This is somebody made a tablet computer. Uh, this is a, a, a video camera someone made. Someone even made a cell phone using a Raspberry Pi. Uh, very cool. Uh, we have a, my, my daughter and I made a Minecraft server on a Raspberry Pi. And uh, it works really well. She and her friends log on to it all the time. My uh, friend's son even logged on to it from an airplane. I thought that was pretty amazing, think, thinking I have this little Raspberry Pi sitting on my desk that's blinking away, and there's like a, a kid flying in the sky who's like accessing it to play Minecraft. It's crazy. So th this is why having quick prototyping is important, because mistakes are inevitable. Whenever you design something, you are going to make mistakes, no matter how careful you are. And that's a good thing, because those mistakes are going to help you refine your project, make you focus on what is important, uh, take you in a different direction if you have to do that. And the earlier you can get those mistakes out of the way, the better it is, the better the product is, the faster you're going to get something that's cool, uh, and the less expensive it is. If you don't discover a project until after you put a lot of time and money in it, and it's a big project that makes you do a reboot on that basic design, it's like super expensive and frustrating. So this is kind of a curve. Um, the more mistakes you make early on, the better the innovation is. So um, you, know, you don't intentionally make mistakes. You don't make mistakes on purp purpose. But mistakes lead to great things. And then funding. This is something that is really cool. Things like Kickstarter and Indiegogo. Before that, if you wanted to get money for a project, you either had to do it out of your pocket, find friends. Um, who are willing to invest or seek VC money. And all of those have their problems. Sometimes it works, but for a lot of people, none of those were a viable option. But crowdsourcing, now you can post your project to one of these cr crowdfunding sites, like Kickstarter, and, and it's a way to kind of test the market. Like these guys wanted to make a tripod a mount for iPhone so that you could shoot videos on an iPhone and have it on a tripod so you don't have to hold it. And so they said, you know, we want $10,000 for the tooling so that we can make these things as injected molded plastic parts. And it turned out that people liked the idea so much that they got $137,000 in funding for it. And um, it's, it's a, an example of something a venture capitalist would not be interested in a project that was $10,000 or $137,000 investment. It would have to be, you know, upwards of a million dollars before they, they would even get out of bed. So this is like a perfect kind of project. Um, Kickstarter, I, I think, uh, you know, there are, are there examples of people getting a lot more money than that. Like the Pebble Watch, I think, was $10 million. But really, I think this kind of crowdsourcing, this area, this kind of spectrum between funding it out of your pocket, you know, more than $500 and less than, than $50,000. That's like a great great place to get the money that you need. And so manufacturing has, has become less expensive, easier to use, and um, uh, smaller to do. So, so this is something that's called a shop bot. You can see the size of it. It's not really that big. And there's this couple, uh, their names are Jeffrey and Jillian. They live in Oakland. They have a company called Because We Can. And they bought a shop bot. And they make custom furniture with it. And they typically do uh, interiors for, for like new media companies and things. This is the uh, meeting room for a company that, that does the Emily the Strange Character uh, products. And you can see these really cool chairs. Look at the neat designs in those chairs. So they just draw the designs in Adobe Illustrator and then lay wood down on this bench. And this shop bot routes out the Adobe Illustrator design and so look at the tabletop and everything. If this is something that uh, you would have custom ordered before something like ShopBot came along, it would have been incredibly expensive. Uh, but the ShopBot itself is, is uh, about $25,000, which is absolutely affordable for a small business. 
And the company that makes ShopBot is now making something called the HandyBot. Uh, it's a $2,500 version that instead of having the router uh, move over the, uh, the wood that you set down, or, or soft metal or plastic, this thing you actually set down on the wood and it, it drives around routing as it, as it moves. And the cool thing is, I, I don't have it in the picture there, but it's got an iPad attached to it. So what you do is you can um, just call up a pattern that you want. You can order pattern shapes from them and pay a couple of bucks for the pattern and then buy it and then just set it down and it will cut it out. Or you can hold it up against the wall and cut out a cutout for a, uh, uh, like an AC outlet or a light socket fixture or something like that. And so this is a $2,500 machine. And, and I think that uh, it's, it's going to, th this kind of thing is going to become more and more popular. Laser cutters have gone down in price significantly. It's like, uh, it's like a laser printers and laser cutters are like the same kind of thing except separated by uh, a couple of decades. And uh, this one was $740 for a laser cutter. The, the thing you do have to consider is that um, it's a laser cutting into material and like plastic or wood and so there's smoke and, and fumes so you need to vent that stuff out. That's an additional cost and that's really one of the kind of the gating factors about them. But small businesses are using them because they're so uh, useful. A lot of, a lot of uh, model making companies, or model companies like balsa wood airplane companies are using laser cutters now because they can quickly, super quickly cut out the patterns in sheets of balsa wood. Before that, they, they would have to order uh, dies that would cut out the shapes in the balsa wood and punch them out. And if you had to make a change to it, you would have to have a tooling change and that cost a lot of money and it takes time. With this, with the laser cutter, it's just software. It's really easy and quick to do. So you can have all sorts of really cool innovative designs and be very experimental too. You can be much bolder with a laser cutter than you can by using a, a metal punch. So just a quick look at, at what some of these new technologies produce. And you can see they have a unique look to them. And it's a kind of thing that traditional manufacturing would have a, a tough time making and, and would be pretty expensive. But what you see here is, is quite inexpensive and, and attractive too. That's the thing. The earlier making stuff had its own kind of rugged charm. But this is like actually has, has a lot of aesthetic value to it, I think. And um, we're going to just see things get more and more beautiful. I was at Maker Faire Rome and the Italians are doing incredible stuff with laser cut wood that just blew me away. Sales and distribution has changed in a big way so that individuals can start companies and uh, compete with the big guys. This is Chris Anderson from Wired and, and his partner Jordi Munoz. They started 3D Robotics and uh, they make the autonomous drones. And it's just these two guys and they, uh, they've been hiring more people, but it just started out as a hobby, you know, making little plastic bag kits, and now they've got their own business because they're taking advantage of all those things that I showed you in that earlier slide, the, the uh, end of the organizational advantage. This is uh, uh, Lamore Freed and Phil Tyrone. They've started an electronics uh, kit company called Adafruit, and it was just the two of them, and now they are a multi-multi-million dollar a year company Again, using all of those DIY systems to get started. They did a great job. Before I show you the next picture, I, I just wanted to uh, tell you about this, this fellow. His name's Quinn. Uh, a makerspace in Los Angeles called LA Makerspace called me and said, we'd like you to do an Arduino workshop for, for kids and, and uh, parents. And I said, OK, that sounds fun. I'd be happy to do it. And they said, and we have someone on staff to help you. A guy named Quinn, and he'll he'll like help thing help you facilitate, you know, hand out the the components and things like that. And he he's really good at Arduino. And I said, great. So I I emailed Quinn. I said, here are the projects that I'm going to do. Here's some of the schematics. Here's the software for the Arduino. And he's writing back. He's like, yeah, that's pretty good, but you know, you can make this code more efficient. And really, it's better to wire it up this way. And so I'm like, thank you so much, Quinn. You know, I really appreciate it. It's great that you know all this stuff. So then I got there. This is Quinn. <laughs> he's, he's 12 years old. And he was there, and 
um, he actually has a company that he started at age 10 called Q Techno. And these are all the components he's developed. They're all um, Arduino compatible peripherals that do different things, sensing and things like that. And the reason you can really, I mean, even if you didn't meet him, you would be able to know he's 12 because the, the item on the lower right is a fart sensor. <laughs> but Quinn's a cool guy. I met his parents are a couple of pediatricians and they're like, we have no idea what he's doing or how he's doing it. We're just like here to drive him around. <laughs> This, he's a super cool kid. So uh, here are some more of what uh, I'm calling this Maker Phase 2 creations. Look at them and like this is stuff that you would see uh, coming out of like Samsung or Apple or Sony or something. They just look very slick and polished and it's and I'm not saying that's the only way that ma making things should be because I, I do like that rough look and the prototype look but they are there to be, they're, they're really there in the market. They're not going away. This is, this is like the real deal. So I just wanted to show a few uh, cool uh, kind of projects that I've seen lately that I think are impressive. This is a remote control cockroach. It's a real live Madagascar hissing cockroach. And it's got a, uh, a circuit board that's been uh, temporarily glued to its back and then uh, some electrodes are attached to its antenna, and you can then just set it on the ground and steer it with a remote control, and make it go one direction or the other. So the guys who made it sent me the kit, along with six cockroaches, <laughs> and I, I showed my daughters, and they're like, well, what are you gonna do with these? And I showed them this picture, and they're like, no way, you're not doing that. So we ended up having six pet cockroaches. <laughs> and they like organic lettuce. This is a, a really cool project. Again, something that was developed using an Arduino in a single weekend for under $100. And those are uh, proximity sensors on the front. And it's got some vibrating cell phone motors inside. And you wear this on your wrist. And you can hold it in front of you. And as you walk around outside or around the room, the motors will thump as you approach uh, an obstacle. So it was developed for blind people. Or if you're like in a, you know, somewhere dark, like a cave or something, you don't have light, I guess. But anyway, um, imagine like developing something like this before this kind of technology was around. It would be like a, an expensive, complicated undertaking. And now it's something that you knock together in a weekend. This is done by Steve Hofer, who is also the creator of the Secret Knock gumball machine. <laughs> and you need to know the Secret Knock before it dispenses a gumball. <laughs> I really like that one. Um, I'll, I'm going to skip this uh, next couple of slides just because we're running low for time. Oh, I mean, um, this this one I, I wanted to just explain a little bit. Um, there, uh, after the Fukushima disaster, the Japanese government was issuing sporadic radiation levels for uh, Tokyo, and people were concerned: Are these are, is the data that we're being supplied by the government accurate? Are we getting it f frequently enough? What are they, they hiding something from us? So a hackerspace in Tokyo and a hackerspace in Los Angeles got together and decided to work on a way to monitor radiation levels in Japan and do a better job than the government was doing. So this is their final result. Um, they call it the B Geigi. And uh, uh, it's like Geiger counter and bento box because it's like a little, I, I guess it looks kind of like a little, bento box meal or something. Um, but it contains a Geiger counter, a GPS unit, and a Wi-Fi radio, and some other circuitry. And they made a bunch of these, and they gave them out to people in Japan. And they said, just hang it out your window, like in a little pouch, and just drive around like you normally do. Driving to work, to the store, driving your kids to, to soccer, whatever. And then uh, when you get home, just uh, plug it into the recharging station and make sure that you have an open Wi-Fi connection. So people would do that. And, and what it was doing was it was taking radiation readings like every five seconds and uh, stamping that with the time and the uh, GPS location where that reading was taken. And then that data 
is uh, uploaded to this uh, website called SafeCast that the hackerspace has started. They have 10, so far they have 10 million data points. They probably have more by now. That was like a year ago, the last time I talked to them. And you can see here, uh, this is uh, uh, Honshu, and you can see the hotspot obviously is where uh, uh, Fukushima uh, reactor is. And um, you know, there's a few other strange aberrations around and stuff like that. But this data is extremely useful. It's open for everybody to use uh, the raw data set. So scientists are using it. Imagine if the, the Japanese government said, "Okay, we're going to uh, you know develop a, a distributed radiation monitoring system." How much money and time would it have taken them to do that? You know, this probably. The, the, the thing that these hackers did was not cheap. It probably was like $50,000 to do because those, those B Geige units were like $750 each. But I just would have to think that this would cost millions and millions and millions of dollars and tons of red tape and, you know, contracts and all sorts of red tape. Just it may not have even happened or it would have been done in, in a half-baked way. But these guys really nailed it. It was really great. So I <clears throat> wanted to conclude by, you know, I've been showing you like all this really cool technology and how far forward we've advanced. But uh, Scott Weaver really like, t to me, shows me what making is all about. I, I met him at a maker fair in, in, the, in San Francisco a couple of years ago. And this is his, uh, th this is all the materials he uses. He's got a knife, a glue, and toothpicks. That's it, what you see there. And this is what he makes. This is San Francisco. And you can see the marbles down at the bottom of the tray. You can put the marbles in and they like weave around San Francisco. They go around Coit Tower. They go to Chinatown. They go down the Golden Gate Bridge and then they end up in the tray there. And, and I said, Scott, you are like emblematic. You're an exemplar of making. I've got to take your picture so, so I can show people who you are. And he's like, okay, but, but, but let me put on my costume first. I mean, he, he's the ultimate maker, and, uh, and so I, I hope that uh, what he, he does in his spirit and enthusiasm uh, will inspire you to go out there and make your own stuff, too. Thanks. Yeah, I, I'm happy to take questions. If uh, and if you have to leave, that's fine because I know I used up, um, I think, uh, my full amount of time here. But uh, any questions, I'm happy to to talk. Hi. Um, I'm interested to know because uh, so much of what you guys are doing, um, what what you've been talking about today, is very much exploratory kinds of research. Um, I'd be interested to know uh, what kinds of discussions you guys have maybe at the magazine level about ethics and, and you know, sort of chains of distribution, those kinds of things. Like, do you talk about those things and, and what is kind of on your mind about that? Yeah, um, so, so ethics, could you be a, a little more specific? I'm not exactly sure. I, I guess it was, it, it's, sorry, it's a pretty broad question. I was just thinking that um, there's that interesting tension in which you were talking about, um, you're talking about it from a, from a hands-on perspective, mm -hmm. but you were talking about, you know, because we can't do like our sort of TV and screwing and, and tube testing, et cetera, et cetera, um, you know, that we, we sort of end up crashing things. And you weren't making an ethical statement mm -hmm. about that, but, but, but there is sort of an ethics there. And yet at the same time, so much of this stuff is made possible because of, um, you know, like you're saying, well, 5,000 motors for 17 cents. So, you know, who are our sources? And, yeah. And those sorts of, and what do you, yeah. what do you guys talk about, about that? Um, you know, we, we do have those kinds of discussions. We, we think about um, the function and purpose of the, the projects that we have in there. We think about, you know, waste. Uh, reuse is really important to us. We have a, a guy who regularly rides around his bicycle in neighborhoods and, and picks up things that people have thrown away and then takes them apart and shows you the components. So, you know, an old VCR, all the useful components. You grab an old dishwasher, 
he wasn't able to take it back on his bike, but um, <laughs> he got it home somehow and took it apart and showed you all the amazing things. So uh, whenever we have, you know, we, we always encourage people to reuse as much as possible. Um, we really stress the, uh, the, the idea that how, how certain things will affect your, your community you know, is it, is it good for the community? Is it something that's, that's uh, uh, obnoxious? You know, we're not interested in, in something that would be a nuisance to people, like it was, it was especially loud or, or caused some kind of a disruption or something like that. Um, the sourcing thing, um, you know, um, that's something we talked about, like, you know, is it really making if you, if you get stuff sourced out of China or have it manufactured in China? And, um, from my experience in meeting the kind of makers in China, it's been like there are some really smart folks in China and, and a lot of US makers are feeling like they are, are partners with them. There's a company called Seed Studios, S-E-E-E-D, there's three E's in there, and they do Arduino clones and equipment. It's run by a guy named Eric Pan. And, um, you know, you talk to them and they are like so excited about being part of this maker movement. And they're, they're coming to all the maker fairs and it feels like a, a great partnership with, you know, the West and, and Asia that uh, I, I see more good things coming from it than, than negative things. Okay, thanks. Any other questions? Hi, way back there. Thank you. Um, you had a couple um, charts up in your slides, and I was wondering where that information came from. I was particularly interested in the, uh, the innovation curve, the really dramatic jump. The oh, oh, yeah, I just made, made those up. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I just wanted to kind of show, like, in, in my mind, um, how, how that was. And, uh, yeah, there's, there's no data behind it. Uh, I did, like, uh, uh, one, one thing that came to mind, you know, besides the espresso machines, was, like, one thing I like to do is make uh, guitars out of cigar boxes. And so, cigar boxes were uh, created in the uh, American South, like, over 100 years ago by... Uh, by uh, slaves whose ancestors came from Africa and they uh, took the knowledge they used of, of uh, musical instrument making and employed it by you know using the materials that they could get since they didn't weren't allowed to own money things that they could make from stuff other people threw away so they made cigar boxes so for the last hundred years cigar boxes have not changed very much but as soon as they started to become these online groups like cigar box nation where people were like sharing videos and plans and showing how they were like improving or changing cigar boxes, the innovation curve just shot up and there's like this Cambrian explosion of cigar box guitars now, where there's a huge variety of them. And so it was like that, that kind of curve, where it's like cigar box guitars did not change for 100 years and then Cigar Box Nation came along and like, and they're like unrecognizably weird guitars. <laughs> but thanks. Any other questions? Hi. For a novice maker, where would you recommend to start? Uh, there, okay, so, um, you know, I recommend two things. If you, if you don't know what you want to make, that you just want to start making, then I would recommend going to Instructables and signing up for their newsletter, their email newsletter. And then you'll see, like, really inspiring things people have made. It's a wide variety of stuff, you know, like clothing projects to games, um, outdoor activities, electronics projects, and so there's probably something there that will pique your interest. If you kind of have an idea in mind, like, okay, I want to make an Arduino robot that will route itself around my furniture without bumping into it, then I would go to makezine.com, which is Make Magazine's website, and the, the navigational menu at the top will help you drill down to exactly what you want and show you projects there. Um, and then if you're like my kids, the first place they go for anything is YouTube. They just type it in. Rainbow Loom, Polymer Clay Jewelry. It's interesting. It's like the first place they go. YouTube's the only thing that exists. That and Facebook. <laughs> Any other questions? Hi. So besides starting Makerspaces, where do you think or how do you think 
I think uh, besides maker spaces, which tend to be places where people are uh, discussing ideas and but they're really kind of heads down and soldering irons out kind of places, maker fairs uh, are really great as ways to show people uh, and introduce people to the idea of making and get them inspired. Uh, and you know, the model's pretty simple. You invite people who have made things to exhibit their stuff and demonstrate their stuff and tell them that uh, they need to really make sure that their exhibits are hands-on so that it's a very uh, open kind of an atmosphere. And then you invite the public to come check it out and get involved, have workshops there, have a learn how to solder workshop, uh, learn Arduino, Raspberry Pi, all those things. And uh, that kind of community uh, event is like the best way I can imagine of getting people excited about it. And then they'll they'll you know join the makerspace or start makerspaces. Anything else? Oh, okay, way back there. Um, my question is like, what is the direction in the maker community um, for I guess open source versus like the intellectual property and like the profit model? Is the general consensus if I invent Gizmo X Y Z that every maker needs? Am I going to now open source that and the community is going to love it and take it and run with it? Or is the general consensus I take it to a company, I patent it, I hide it, and then when I'm ready to run profit, I distribute it to the maker? In general, it's been pretty open. And uh, there are a couple of reasons for that. One is that just getting a patent is really expensive to do. And if you're a small maker, it's really hard to protect that patent. It would be super expensive to, and you're not going to compete. And the uh, uh, you know Chinese companies are going to knock it off anyway, and there's nothing you can do about it. So the patents are of little value to smaller companies. But the other reason to, to go open source is that you create uh, this uh, ecology around whatever it is that you create if you make it open source. So like Arduino, for instance, only the creators of the Arduino can call their thing an Arduino. The clone makers can call it something else, and they can say it's based on the Arduino open source license. Um, but so, so what happened is, because they made it open source, it became the standard for microcontrollers. There are other microcontrollers out there, like there was one called Basic Stamp that preceded Arduino by probably 10 years, but nobody knows what Basic Stamp is because it was completely proprietary and locked up. And Arduino is open to everybody, so there's this huge, huge ecology surrounding it. And um, Arduino is happy about that because it sells more Arduinos. And Arduino is really careful about making sure that their microcontrollers that are branded Arduino are of the highest quality. So they may be more expensive, but they're like, if you want to make, if you want to get one and you know it's not going to malfunction or smell funny, a lot of Arduino clones have a weird smell for some reason, then, then get the, the real Arduino. Thanks. Um, I've done a little bit of DIY stuff myself, but I find finding parts are really hard to find. You mentioned eBay. Um, you mentioned reusing from things like dishwashers and pulling mm -hmm. parts out. Where else would you recommend looking? I've gotten a lot of stuff on Amazon. Okay. Um, McMaster Car mm -hmm. catalog is good. Um, Alibaba sometimes sells things in smaller quantities. Um, uh, do you have a suggestion? AliExpress has now uh, come out in the last couple of months. It's Alibaba single unit sales. Oh, partner. cool. It's very, very good. Oh, thanks. I'm going to have to check that out. <laughs> That's good. What is it in particular that you're... Um, I have a nine-year-old son, so making things like getting something that has a small motor mm -hmm. and building things from that, or getting small bits of wire, getting a small plug-in, getting something that has a unique kind of battery and a, oh, okay. a case for that, and things yeah, like that. Yeah, oh, okay. Then, yeah. then, uh, then makershed.com is a good place. Uh, uh, Adafruit is good. Mouser. And... Uh, and Spark Fun. Spark. Spark Fun. Fun? Yeah. Awesome. Yeah, sure. Any, I, I think we have time for one more. 
<laughs> you, you may have covered this already, but um, why do you think making is important? Um, because a, a lot of it, well, some of it that you see, I mean, it's really cool, the mm -hmm. idea of it, but cool only lasts for so long, right? Yeah. Before it's, before it's unimpressive, or right. before it's not relevant. So yeah. I'm wondering why you think making is, is important. Yeah, that's, that's, a good, that, that's a really good question. A lot of things in our life we don't have much control over. You know, there's not a lot you can do about the economy. Um, there's not a lot, a lot of the, the systems and things that are fed to us. There's not a lot you can do about uh, uh, the way the world works. And so, you know, typically that extends to the things you buy, the clothes you wear, the food that you eat, the things that you use, the furniture, and stuff like that. So you do have some degree of control over certain things. So you could make your own chair. You could uh, make your own food. You could grow uh, your own vegetable garden. You could raise honeybees. You could raise chickens. Um, you could automate your, your house. Uh, when you have that kind of control over those things, it makes you feel less powerless about the world around you. It, gives you a greater sense of self-efficacy to be able to solve problems. Problems happen to, you know, problems arrive all the time. They just hit us. They happen. And you have a choice. You can either buy a solution to the problem, like most people do, or you can invent a solution that works for you. And, and so once you go down that path of making things, that, that world opens up to you. It really does, and you're like, okay, I can try that, I can do this, and, and I see that with myself all the time, you know, like, the, our thermostat broke, and so I, I bought a new thermostat and replaced it, and I learned, you know, that it's powered by 20 full, 24 volts, I never knew that before, it's really cool, and once I did that, then uh, the dishwasher broke, and I actually, like, got a new dishwasher and installed it myself, and so you feel like, I can take new things on, and, and sure, you will make mistakes along the way, and it will probably take you four or five times as long at least to do it than a professional would. But what you get out of it is, is worthwhile. And I think that's something that we've forgotten about. Our grandparents knew all about that, but we didn't. And so just that, that sense of power that you get from doing that kind of thing is very rewarding and fulfilling. And it's not something that you will know until you experience it yourself. Thanks, and, and I guess that's, that's probably it. Thanks a lot. <laughs>I want to thank Mark. I um, heard Mark at ALA last year in Chicago and was just absolutely inspired, just as I have been after today's talk. And I thought it was a bit of a shot in the dark to uh, email him and ask if he'd, he'd want to come from LA to Edmonton. And he said yes. So we're just <laughs> absolutely thrilled to have him as one of our leader in residence uh, for the next day or two. So I think this has been, as you hoped, very inspiring. And I think uh, a lot of things to contemplate in terms of what role the library has in, in fostering a maker culture that really, really empowers people. is something I think that a public library in particular does. So please join me in thanking Mark. Great job.